Well, it's really encouraging, but not surprising after David's amazing intervention to see so many people um, stay on for uh, a still deeper dive on this really important issue. Um, my name is Jo McRae. Um, I currently work for the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, but I think I'm here because I used to work on this stuff in DEFRA, so it's really nice to be back as um, part of this conversation. Um, what I'd like to do is, if it's all right, we've, we've obviously just heard from David and the amazing work that he's doing at TNFG, but if I could just ask my amazing panel to introduce themselves, uh, who you are, what you do, and what brings you here today. And if you take me start with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Nithika Agarwal. I'm the Head of Sustainable Finance Policy at WWF UK. Um, unsurprisingly, WWF cares a lot about nature, so um, we find ourselves in a lot of conversations and doing a lot of work on um, embedding nature in both financial and economic systems. Um, we're de really delighted with the increased focus there is on nature, and um, we've, we've, I chair the Nature Working Group as part of the UK government's Transition Plan Task Force, um, and we're really seeing momentum there for this more integrated approach between climate and nature, as Dave was talking about earlier. So um, I hope that we can get into some knotty issues today, because um, it's not easy as a practitioner, but they're definitely uh, things that companies can start doing. Thanks, Nikita. Sebastian. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Sebastian Leap, I'm the CEO of NatCap. We're a nature data company. We were spun out of Oxford University a few years back now to commercialise some research that had gone on there. And we really work with corporates and financial institutions to embed nature into their decision making. Um, we've been working at this problem from a few different angles, but excited to shortly be releasing a TNFD aligned um, nature product. So we've spent a lot of time in the weeds of all the various appendices that David's team have been working on to, to try and build something that's practical for companies and financial institutions. So I'll be bringing a bit of the um, practical lens to how companies are thinking about this. Thanks, Sebastian. Helen. Hi, I'm Helen Avery. I head up Nature Programmes at the Green Finance Institute. Um, we were set up to help government and private sector come together to mobilise finance for climate at the time, and that since has expanded to nature, and that's what I work on. So we're a bit of a sister company to CGFI in that we focus mainly on financing green, how we get the money moving for nature is what my, my task is. Uh, we host the TNFD Secretariat. Um, as well, and we do work on some greening finance things, which I think we'll, we'll talk about uh, a bit later. Brilliant, thanks. And just to frame the conversation, um, I guess I'd just like to pick up on a, a few things that um, I think David's very much sort of warmed up already. So one is the sort of relationship, I think, of the sort of climate and the nature agenda. And I think what's been quite exciting over the last few years is we had COP26 really did put nature, I think, quite squarely um, into the climate change agenda. So we're beginning to see the climate folk beginning to edge into the nature space a little bit harder. Um, and then, of course, what we had last December was the signing of the Global Biodiversity Framework in Kunming. And, of course, both the UNFCCC and the Global Biodiversity Framework have quite strong language within them around aligning all private sector flows um, around both net zero uh, and, and, the, and the global goals on biodiversity. So we've kind of got the beginnings of the, these two multilateral agreements, which I think for quite a long time have kind of held the space slightly separately and kind of created two conversations beginning to get um, convergence. But I don't think we're there quite yet. And I'd be really interested to hear from the panelists how we get the climate and the, the nature brackets biodiversity people to be having slightly more fluent conversations across the lines. Because I certainly see in my own world that they're two slightly different universes, but they have very different communities of practice, different languages. And so I'd be really curious to, to hear from you how, from a data perspective, you could help to, to, to unify us. I think what we're also beginning to see is um, movement. Um, David mentioned the Network for Green and Financial System. We've also had statements from um, uh, climate, from finance ministers, um, increasingly looking at kind of the role of nature and obviously the Descripta review was quite influential in that regard. So I think we're beginning to sort of see a translation of those big international legal frameworks into, into policy. And again, I think data can both help to, the presence of these data can help to reassure policymakers that these things are possible 
at the same time that regulators need to be kind of setting out the demand for it. So again, I'd be quite cu curious to hear from the panel about how you sort of see data as part of a push and a pull uh, in, in the conversation. And then I guess finally just be really interesting to think a little bit more about this issue of capability. And I think to your point, David, about um, sometimes the, the biodiversity piece and nature piece feeling like a bit of an afterthought. I've had quite a lot of conversations with financial institutions exactly along the lines that you described, but there's a bit of eye rolling of like, we're still, you know, sort of this <coughs> climate thing. Could you just like give us a bit of space? And exactly, I mean, I loved your language about Mother Earth not waiting, right? And I think how we manage to accelerate the conversation. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear from people about time. So this kind of balance, I think, that we're striking where we need to make sure that we've got systems that are effective, robust, and accurate to avoid greenwashing on the one hand and incompetence. On the other hand, um, all of these crises are really urgent. So I guess those are some of the sort of questions that I feel that I'm um, <laughs> struggling with and looking to, to our panel to, to guide us through. Um, Helen, would you, would you be up for just giving us a bit of a description? I think what's helpful about this discussion is to sort of translate that big picture that David's uh, been talking about into kind of some real stuff that's happening in the real world on the ground. And I know that GFI is absolutely vital in this space, so just great to hear from you. What's, what are you all up to? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so I think, first of all, the way that we've, we've started framing it, and I've only started framing it this way in the last few months, and it speaks to sort of David, David's point and your point about needing to get climate and nature a bit closer together, is that is how do we transition the economy to one that values and invests in the natural environment? And then you could put under that um, the ecosystem service it provides. And I sort of see climate fitting under that umbrella. Uh, and then you could go deep into species and biodiversity as well as under that. But ultimately, that's kind of what we're focusing on. Um, and uh, the, it was sort of heartening that in the latest green finance strategy, there was a lot more nature. I was talking to someone from DEFRA who mentioned it. Nature was mentioned perhaps once or twice in the first green finance strategy. You mentioned, I think, over... Well, many tens of times in the second one. So we're starting to see it come together, although it is you know, climate here and nature here and not natural environment as one. Um, so there are a couple of things we do, and I, because we're sort of focused on greening finance today, I won't talk about the things we do on financing green, although happy to later, um, to, particularly in the context of farming and some of the data that could get some money moving. And, and to be fair, it's quite difficult to separate greening finance and financing green. In the end, it's all about getting those flows through to, to the natural environment. Um, but there are a couple of things. One is, and it talks to the point Andrew made, um, you might not be familiar with this, but we have a group, and I'm going to just get this wrong, so I don't run this group, by the way, it's my colleague, Land, Nature and Adapted Systems. Um, it's an advisory group, and it's actually an extension of the UK Green Taxonomy. Um, we run the um, uh, advisory group for the Green Taxonomy. And this LNAS, as it's uh, um, so jauntily called, is um, actually looking at how we can expand the taxonomy to actually um, identify some of the descriptions that clarify sustainable agriculture investments and sustainable fisheries, and then we'll be looking at forestry as well. And that's such an important piece of work because um, we host the UK National Consultation Group for the TNFD, and a lot of the feedback we've had from asset managers is, well, actually, how do I start saying what is a positive impact? Mm -hmm. Um, so the taxonomy is really important for that, as will transition plans be for nature. And then the other piece I just mentioned is a piece of work we're doing uh, with Bank of England and Oxford and Reading, uh, and also UNEP, WCMC and NISA. And essentially we're overseeing a project of analysis that will um, give a guide to the material risk to UK financial stability born of nature-related dependencies. Um, it's super complicated, and as you can imagine, um, it's not going to be a one and done with this piece of analysis. But there were two reasons that we um, offered to lead this project. Um, and one is we felt that the corporate community in the UK wasn't really, they were putting nature after lunch, basically. In fact, probably maybe down next year's lunch. Mm -hmm. um, and we needed to send a signal that actually there's material risk and that UK government and regulators are on it. So, and the second is that um, Bank of England needs some support. All central banks and financial institutions want to understand how they're going to start analysing um, material risk from dependencies on nature. It's, it was too early for us to look at impacts for reasons that you know, the TNFD is not, not being adopted widely at the moment. Um, so I think they're the couple of things I'm happy to pick up on them. Uh, Thanks, Helen. That's really, really helpful. And I, and I think kind of part of, for example, what your last bit speaks to is both that kind of building capacity issue 
but also thinking where are those big levers to make sure that uh, the agenda is more fully integrated and the Bank of England is clearly one. So good to see that they're kind of building on the work that I know was done in Holland and I think in yeah. France. Yeah. And even in Malaysia, I think they've done that. Yeah, there's a few central banks yeah. now that have started yeah. Very yeah. exciting. Cool. Nikita, do you want to sort of speak a little bit from a WWF <coughs> perspective about um, a nature positive economy, I think, is sort of on the lips of many people and <coughs> kind of understanding the risk is one part of that. But could you just speak more, bro more broadly about what WWF sort of vision is for a nature positive economy? Thanks. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, nature positive economy is a term that's used, but it's probably just worth spelling out exactly what it means. So it means there's more nature in 2030 than we have in 2020, basically. Um, that we've halted the alarming decline of nature that we currently see and reversed that by 2030 so that nature is on a path to recovery. Um, and a nature positive economy is an economy that facilitates that process rather than the current economy we have, which is nature negative. Our whole economic system has been built around extracting from nature rather than regenerating it. Um, so, um, there's a, you, you, you raised a really good question right at the start of your comments around this whole, um, you know, companies are still getting, getting um, used to climate related disclosures, it's a lot to kind of get your head around what's the case to sort of look at nature now. Um, so, uh, uh, we found that like, the best way to sort of get cut through on this is um, just two really simple facts. So nature is responsible, the loss of nature is responsible for 23% um, of global emissions <clears throat> and nature has the potential to sequester over a third of our carbon emissions. And so it's, it's, it makes very little business sense not to look at the two together and that was it came through loud and clear um, in David's comments earlier. Um, now what 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 are the kind of opportunities aside from the, the, the kind of climate um, implications of nature recovery um, if we really are thinking about a nature positive economy all the opportunities that come from essentially rewiring an economy to be nature positive um, are like abundant, kind of in the same way that people have rightly got quite excited about the zero carbon transition or the net zero transition. We need to be thinking about a net zero and nature positive transition. Um, we're obviously TNFD is a key, absolutely key keystone of companies um, work to understand, align the private sector with nature positive. Um, but there's, at least we've been finding, there's a little bit of a narrative, which is, T, you know, TNFD is there, if we're focused on TNFD, that, that's great, we're doing nature positive. But, but TNFD, it's, it, it's like saying, oh, if we've done TCFD, it's the equivalent of being, doing the net zero transition. They're absolutely not the same thing, that it's an essential part of a full transition and so one of the things that WWF has been thinking about is well if you if you think about what we've put in place for climate in order to facilitate a net zero transition and you compare what exists for nature the nature pieces of that are really still quite nascent so we we we, we, ha we had the Paris agreement obviously several years ago we've just had the GBF um, we, we have uh, sectoral pathways set out at a global level. The IEA has done work on what a net zero transition looks like at a sectoral level, at a global level, and then you get national sectoral pathways. That doesn't yet exist for nature, so nobody actually has a clear idea of what a nature positive transition looks like. That's work that WWF is actually trying to um, progress and provide an illustrative version of um, and I know the World Economic Forum and WBCD are also doing work in that space. Um, and then the breakdown of those GBF goals into metrics, targets that are actionable at a company level, that, has, you know, that, that is where CNFT is going to be so helpful and that's just happening. So we're a long way off actually um, 
integrating uh, nature into our financial and economic decision making. I should have said also aligning multilateral and development finance and public finance with nature positive and climate goals. It's not like we're all there on climate either, by the way. It's not like we've, we've ticked all of those boxes on climate, but we are much further ahead on climate than we are with nature. But it, it makes very little business sense. And I'll just end with one kind of final anecdote from our chairing of the nature positive, uh, the, the, the nature group of the Transition Plan Task Force. There are some companies, particularly in the agricultural space, who actually, you know, the, in agriculture, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer that you've got to think about nature um, in, in the same breath that you think about climate. And they're actually saying, you know what, it, it's actually harder for us to think about climate only or nature's intersection, only the part of nature that intersects with climate. It's like this weird splitting of the two, it makes more sense, it's easier for us to think about climate and nature together. Mm -hmm. That doesn't hold true for all sectors, um, but I think there's a lot to learn from a sector like that. Um, I'll leave it there, um, but, but yeah, you, but thank you. Thank you, that was really helpful, and maybe that would provide a bit of a segue into just asking David really about um, what you've, I think, a question for David, which is, Nikita, I think you've, you've articulated how in order to drive a transition in terms of um, alignment of financial flows, you need disclosure mechanisms, but you also need a whole ecosystem of other things to happen around that, whether that's transition plans, whether it's around the way that the banks are stress testing, etc. And David, I'd be keen, your, your sort of analysis, Nikita, was that that, eco, that kind of ecosystem of institutions remains quite nascent in the nature space compared to, quotes, the climate space. And David, it'd just be interesting to sort of see how, to better understand how TNFD is working with others in order to kind of build that broader ecosystem of, that will help to accelerate the transition, <coughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, it's been very interesting listening to comments from my panel here, because what we're actually talking about is how to create change. Um, and if you look at climate, where I think you said that, you know, we're further ahead, we're woefully behind where we need to be on climate. So clearly the approach that we've taken for climate hasn't really worked. 20% um, of public companies have a net zero transition plan aligned to the Paris Agreement of 1.5, so that's after seven years. So can we wait another 28 years for the other 80% to catch up? No, we can't. So we have to think this. I, I mean, I was lucky enough to run a large business and, and have this challenge of regulation coming at me and thinking, what on earth do I do in the three minutes I've got to look at this problem? And, um, and I recognised at the time when I was hit with TCFD, um, we have an extraordinary capacity to make things that should be relatively simple complicated. Um, and we have an army of people putting terms around this and talking about transition plans and all these other areas. And I think... I think what we should do, you know, the, the theory of fear doesn't work. So if we, you know, I, I've told so many people that we've lost 69% of all of our nature and biodiversity um, and that we lose a primary forest every six seconds the size of a football pitch. I mean, it just washes off people. They're sort of like, yeah, yeah, but someone else will deal with that. That's not me, that's, that's someone else. So I don't think the fear tactic is working. I think what's required if, if I were leading a large company now is I'd reset and say, right, Forget climate, forget nature. Let's relook at our business model. Let's understand our total and comprehensive dependencies on nature, including atmospheric pollution, including atmospheric CO2 and temperatures. Embody that too. And understand how over the next 30 years I'm going to make that sustainable. Because I know the amount of plastic I'm producing isn't sustainable. I know the amount of water I'm using is not sustainable. Uh, and I know that the way that I'm um, removing land, maybe not directly but indirectly through my supply chains because I'm a supermarket selling meat stocks, is not sustainable. And I would look at that, <clears throat> I would use the GBF as my guide, it's, you know, there are 23 targets, there's really a few that really matter. Land use change is right at the top because that has been proven by the scientists to be the thing that removes biodiversity more than ever. And simply say, where in my business model am I changing land or ocean use? And where do I need to stop that and change it? There's some really good examples of this. One of the companies I most admire that's done this is Tetra Pak. I actually started work in the packaging industry many years ago. 
Um, and when I started in the packaging industry, we were inventing new forms of plastic and celebrating how clever it was. Like, little would we know 30 years later. We've now polluted everyone's <coughs> bloodstreams with the stuff. Um, but Tetra Pak have created a completely 100% nature-based packaging system. They started this journey three years ago, recognising that there are going to be enormous demand. Like many things that come out of Scandinavia, they tend to be more long-term and forward-thinking. And they now can produce billions of packaging items that are completely produced by nature and will biodegrade um, into the system. And they reckon this is worth $10 billion of value to them. And I think we've got to sell the opportunity of sustainability and not get like, bogged down in these endless ESG debates um, and, and other areas and start as companies thinking about what's the opportunity to transition from where I was before <coughs> to where I am. This point about <clears throat> we're further behind, we're actually not further behind on nature, I actually think we're further behead, ahead and here's the reason. Regenerative farming was not cooked up in a lab you know, four years ago, it was invented thousands of years ago. <coughs> Um, natural products were invented thousands of years ago. Techniques like this are actually well established, well proven and understood. What we've done is we've mechanised in the last few years everything that we possibly can. And now we're realising that whilst that was fantastic for productivity, it wasn't necessarily good for those resources that we're exhausting. So we've almost got to go back to some of these methodologies and think how can I make them as productive as my mechanised version but less harmful. And therein lies the investment opportunity. I think. I talk to a lot of the investment managers, there's a lot in the room, I talk to a lot of people at Pollination and the other areas about some of the nascent areas, alternative meats, vertical farming, regenerative farm and carbon soil offsets, all of these areas. I think we've got to start talking about the positive areas and how they align to the GBF goals, which are very simple in how they describe the problem. Um, and we as TNFD can help because we can, we've published that standard disclosure framework that indicates according to the GBF how you're doing. So if you're, you're a financial investor, and you say to a company, well, I want to invest in you, but I want to know that your business model is going to be around in 10 years because of these sustainability pressures. We give you a hope that that's there. So how, that's how we're working with people. But I think we, we can't take the same time that we've taken on climate. Uh, we simply can't afford the time. The nature loss that we're experiencing now is far more severe than climate change on its own. A lot of it's produced by climate change. And so we have to find different ways of encouraging people to change as opposed to using some of the methods of the old. Yeah, I love, I love that sort of lifting it out of, you know, an apparently sort of very geeky, techie piece into like, how do we think about change? How do we engage uh, folks so that they kind of want to, want, want to uh, act on this agenda? Sebastian, just sort of riffing off that a little bit, it'd be really interesting to understand how the data that you're um, generating is helping to articulate not just the risks associated with um, harming nature, but also the opportunities for... Uh, nature positive investment. Could you tell us a bit more about your work? Yeah, absolutely. So I, if we look at where, where, where the landscape is today in terms of companies trying to embed nature in decision making, uh, I think as David alluded to, there are a few pockets of sectors and geographies that are leading. So France has had regulation on biodiversity for a while. Their companies, <laughs> unsurprisingly, are a bit ahead. Mining has had regulatory pressures and oil and gas. And so there are some learnings we can take from that. Um, and then agriculture is a, a mixed bag, some, in some ways very much ahead, in some ways very much behind. Um, so, so I think we can take learnings from, from select bits of the world and select sectors. If we zoom into how are UK financial institutions embedding nature and decision making, which is maybe more relevant for, for this crowd, I think we are at the stage where it's on the agenda, it's getting traction, people know it's coming and it has to start this year. I think just as you said, the typical response that we get when we're engaging companies is, I've not even done scope three yet. How on earth am I supposed to start with TNFD? And you know, there's five annexes and I only have um, however many hours in the day. So uh, I think the first place you start is there is some measurement work to try and cut through the complexity and just allow a few areas of focus to come out. Um, and that doesn't have to be super complex. I mean, there is a very simple two by two, if you're a big financial institution, a bank or an asset manager, ranking sectors, a sectoral materiality and prioritization is often somewhere where you might start. And that can just be looking at impacts, dependencies, the bubble can be the size of your exposure. ING were the first to come out with this. Um, a bunch of banks have started that. And that's the first kind of gateway into this, which is just thinking about, okay, where in my portfolio <clears throat> is this real and material? Often it's agriculture, maybe it's forestry, utilities, mining, but it, it, it will quickly slim down 
the, the area of focus to just a few, few sectors. I think a second way of cutting this is then the dependency or impact lens, which is where are the, where are the dependencies or impacts in your portfolio most material. Um, HSBC did some interesting work with that lens, finding that water dependency was most material for them, and looking at the non-climate related water dependency of um, heavy industrial companies in their portfolio, and finding there was a lot of um, a very material impact on, on credit risk. Um, and then I think another lens is, is, is geographic. Because nature is so place-based, what are the bits of the world where my operations or my portfolio are most closely aligned? So I think that's where companies, to question in terms of how we, we help and how we're helping companies is today we're at a stage of how do we sift through all of this noise and just focus on a, a few areas to, to get started. And then once you have that, the, the things that come next are, okay, what's our theory of change to actually make a difference on the ground? What do we report this year versus next year to our stakeholders? How do we start setting some targets that are realistic but also in inspiring? Um, so that's the kind of building blocks. What we've decided to do is, is really go deep on agriculture, just because that's where the overwhelming um, just nature destruction is, is being driven from. Um, and in particular, try to create data that's relevant at the site level that's sensitive both to the precise location of assets and how they're being managed. And I think there's a risk that we're hearing from some asset managers that we're stuck in a bit of a loop whereby if you operate only at the portfolio and at a very high level, it's very hard to translate that into actual changes on the ground and to make a difference. And all of this agenda actually often boils down to a few relatively basic things on the ground. Within agriculture, it's things like cover crops, it's things like no-till, it's things like sensible manure management, it's things like moving away from monocropping towards um, agroforestry and other farming techniques. And, and if you start to address agriculture, you just address a lot of it. So uh, what, what we're, our data is trying to do is, is move beyond just a portfolio country level, sector level, high level assessment of where your impacts are and helping a, a company measure precisely in their supply chain or precisely in their portfolio at the asset level, what are the impacts and dependencies? And as a result of that, what are some of the things you could be different, doing differently? That's super helpful, Sebastian, thank you. And I guess part of what you're really emphasizing is that the data that you're producing is really helping to tell companies stories about both where they're carrying risk, but also to <coughs> articulate where there's more opportunity. And Helen, I know you do a lot of thinking around um, how to kind of work with corporates to identify where the big opportunities are in terms of investment. And just be interesting, you've given some very concrete examples, Sebastian, about how to sort of pull out from this very detailed da data, where are those big opportunities, where the risk. How, how is that playing out in, in your world? Uh, in terms of working with corporates to see yeah, what and just in terms is. of do, are you saying that corporates are beginning to see that there is a, that there is an opportunity there as well as a cost? Because I think you know part of everything as David picked up right in his intervention at the beginning, at the moment it's quite easy to free ride on natural capital. Um, so kind of switching that around about where the investment opportunity is for doing quotes the right thing is just quite quite difficult. So just how, how are you feeling that that? story is unfurling and what do we need to do to make it more compelling? I mean, I'd be interested to hear what Nitika and David say, but my understanding from my discussions with UK corporates is that's not really on their radar, the opportunity yeah. side. We're just getting through on the risk side, but the opportunity side isn't there. Hence, with that piece of Bank of England work that we wanted to do had this sort of primary motive from our side, has a different motive from Bank of England, of course, really just to start getting out in front of UK corporates to say, let's start, I mean, the theory of change is if you start to realise there's a risk and you'll start to invest uh, and there's the opportunity and that's where you need transition plans and a taxonomy to show you what you could be investing in. So I think it's early days and I would say it's a big gap in the way I sort of put plastics as a gap, I put the opportunity piece as a gap, I put nature restoration rather than net offsets as a bit of a gap at the moment. Um, I mean, there are pockets. So, for example, you know, we have sort of land-based projects in the UK. We work a lot on through um, supporting the National Environment Investment Readiness Fund and a similar investment readiness fund in, in Scotland that's developing projects on the ground of nature restoration that will attract investment. But that can only work, and everyone jumps to the investment side, isn't it amazing? We'll have billions coming in from asset managers. It only works if there's a corporate sat in the middle buying the credits whether they're carbon credits, biodiversity credits, biodiversity net gain, or nutrient neutrality, that only works for that. And there's actually a gap right at the moment. We have a big supply, we have all this focus on investment, and then we have the demand in the middle, there's a, there's a big gap. And that's just sort of real asset 
nature restoration. Um, it, my understanding of private equity is that that has, it's becoming more interesting, some of the nature, especially on the ag tech side, and the tech and data side is really interesting to companies as an investment. But um, that's all I'm seeing, but I'm really keen to hear what others are seeing. The key to that, David? Yeah, um, it, it's really interesting. Every, anything I've heard from companies around the opportunity has been around carbon credits mm -hmm. and biodiversity credits which really worries me um, because um, that, that, I mean, that, that, that is a market in and of itself and that's great, that should exist, but um, it, it's really interesting. I was having a conversation with um, a, a, a corporate that's both an insurer and an investor and we were asking about how um, programs run by WWF that would ultimately reduce flood risk um, wouldn't that be an opportunity on the insurance side? And interestingly, um, through that, what transpired from that conversation is well, the only the only way we can think of like making this sort of project commercial rather than philanthropic <coughs> is the the credit, the biodiversity or the carbon credit side of things, um, because we don't yet we can't yet model it into showing that there would be a benefit in the time horizon that's relevant for our insurance business. And that was quite a shock to me. I was like, that, and that is what I'd say is the difference between a nature positive economy and kind of finding one like t small way to monetize or value nature. A nature positive economy would mean that we were, um, that we had a way to value the ecosystem services of a coastal wetland in reducing insurance premiums and therefore it would make commercial sense for an insurer to invest in that wetland but that that currently doesn't translate at a company level um, and, it, and it, I'm, I'm not the expert here it has something to do with time frames maybe I don't know Helen if you've got some more to add from from some of the kind of quantification of risks that you're doing but um, I found that really fascinating. But it's, a, it's an interesting case example of, if you think about what would it take to make the UK a nature positive economy, one of the problems we have is Mother Nature is very connected, but our systems are not. So, so a good example, we're, one of our members is Holson, the big construction, manufactures construction products, including a lot of concrete, which as we all know has big implications on both CO2 emissions and the natural environment. Um, and they're creating materials that rather than just throw water off, actually absorb water. Um, now, for the last 50 years, we've made big concrete structures and roads and other things, and we collect all the water that comes from them, we throw them down a drain as fast as we can, and then we're all surprised when Thames Water can't deal with the amount of water they have and throw sewage in the rivers, and we quite rightly blame Thames Water, but you have to look at this connected system and think, isn't the problem upstream from this. We're, we're treating our land and our built environment so that it throws off water as fast as it possibly can. Why not rethink that? The problem is the economics for that don't work because the person who benefits isn't necessarily the person that pays. And so this only works in a, in a market environment where you have government policy and intervention and rules that kind of help it along. Because I think left to its own natural systems, if you excuse the pun, we won't reflect the connectivity of nature with the connectivity of our financial and economic system. That's where government policy um, can actually intervene and, and help us with rules and regulations from simple things, for example, should new buildings collect rainwater as well as collect solar. In countries like Switzerland that are, I think, far ahead of the UK on this kind of issue, we'll probably get to a nature positive economy first, they're thinking and acting on those kind of rules that mean that supply demand characteristics are pushed into action. Um, and we saw this with, with the great success with offshore wind. Offshore wind would not be as successful as it is today if it hadn't been subsidised. And because of the subsidies, huge investment went into it and lo and behold, 10 years later, we've now got offshore wind is cheaper to produce electricity than it is other sources. We need those kind of interventions from government um, as well, because we can make a lot of efforts as financial institutions and corporations, but it will take a long time to reflect that connectivity of Mother Nature um, in the systems that we're actually building. So I think that's where we need to, as groups, work not just with each other, but with government policy and help 
inform and help and support them on thinking how to bring a connected system together that is currently very fragmented. That's great. I'm, I'm sure that there'll be folk in the room who've got <coughs> questions for our panel as well. What I might do is just take two or three, if that's all right. Does somebody have a microphone? Uh, oh, thank you so much. So I think I'm making you come all the way to the front, but there's, so there's a lady here and then there's a gentleman at the back and then Chris. Oh, okay, we'll start with Chris then. <laughs> Thanks. So um, I wanted to come back to this point around um, investment in nature positive and opportunities. Um, we uh, at Impact, so Impact Asset Management, we invest in the transition to sustainable economy. We've got quite a lot of uh, companies we're investing in that address the drivers of biodiversity loss. So the five drivers, you know, you can you can kind of consider. Uh, alternatives to deforestation or alternatives to using natural resources out of uh, out of oceans and, and the like but we um, we just commissioned a project with Imperialist and we published a report this week where we were going out to look for companies that were doing biodiversity positive investments and it was it was pretty slim pickings uh, and it is quite apparent so we, we found case studies there's an insurance potential insurance one so one in, a few in the energy sector out there, we looked at one in cities, another in the agricultural ch uh, chain, and one in water. And they all looked on their face like these were positive sort of biodiversity investments. But there are two, two insights I just want to flag. First one is, none of them were investing in biodiversity as the main driver of the investment. It was all to do with co-benefits um, that actually outweighed the biodiversity positive impact. And the second one was, People are actually quite shy about talking about this stuff and being transparent about the benefits to the company and the benefits to nature. Mm. It feels like we're, so when you say we're ahead of the game, I guess in that respect, people are still not really talking about the positive opportunities. So my question to the panel is, um, I think you've alluded to the role of public policy here, but it feels to me there is a massive role for public policy to showcase the kind of society that you're suggesting, what do we need to do in terms of sectoral transformations, but also just to try to address this market failure. There is a, a huge market failure here that, that, that we're, ne we're not going to get anywhere near addressing the problem unless we tackle that head on. So you're no longer in DEFRA, so you don't have to answer the question on DEFRA's department. But isn't that where we need to be focusing a lot of our attention? Is how we, how we fundamentally get nature included in valuation as well. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to, I think the lady next to if I could just take two or three questions. That's I think the lady question. next to you also had a question. Would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, thanks very much. Kirsty Hamilton, I've got an affiliation with Chatham House. I just wanted to, just for, for clarification, what is the, the main opportunity base that you're looking at in, uh, acro across this area? I've been in climate for a long time. Is it actually revenue from offsets? And uh, Because I think we need to be <coughs> clear about, and I'm also interested in how you deal with, with that, because obviously you've got fossil fuel emissions that are in a relatively capped to geological you know, uh, store, and then you've got an uncapped vulnerable terrestrial and uh, oceanographic ecosystem and selling between the two uh, raises a, a lot of con controversial issues that have been controversial for a long time. So just very interested in how you see this in this, in this new initiative. Thanks. Brilliant. So amazing panel. We've got a question on kind of what's, what's the kind of policy framework. Is the opportunity primarily around offset or other? And then there was somebody else I think there was a lady in the middle was first and then we'll take that cluster and then we'll go to the gentleman at the back. There's a lady just there. And then, so we'll come to you in just a second if we may. Hi, great um, contributions this afternoon. I'm Stella Whitaker, I'm doing my PhD at Copenhagen Business School and I'm doing it for my sins in climate finance for urban adaptation. So I'd like to ask the panel just very simply um, if you think, um, so I've done, a lot, I've done three case studies, Singapore, London, and some of the people here in the audience and they have interviewed for the research, and Copenhagen, and um, interviewed over 50 investors from across all different uh, parts of the ecosystem, in the ecosystem, um, a lot of data. Um, basically, the investment in adaptation is minimal. And, taking the words of investors of all types. People 
are interested, but perceptions <coughs> and behaviours are uh, forming huge barriers. So I was just wondering, it's really important to, when you talk about climate, that you clear that it's adaptation as well as mitigation, because I call it now the Cinderella, um, and she's fallen off the wagon and desperately trying to get back on board. Because I do also wonder from the responses I got that if they're in competition, that adaptation is competing for the same finance that mitigation is that's available for mitigation that's available for nature. So, and they are all interconnected. You might be able to find projects that are commercial, and there are examples around the world that can deliver on all of those three together. So I just wanted to know from the panel, when you say climate, are you explicitly mentioning adaptation as well? Thank you so much for flagging the adaptation term and the interplay particularly. I think nature's got a key role to play. I think that's, um, I'm going to take this little cluster because they're all such great questions. Um, David, do you want to say something on the sort of market failure and policy <coughs> framework? Well, it's great to hear from um, Impacts because they are one of the probably longest serving companies looking at investing in nature positive. When I first got this role, um, having come from the background I had, recognising that I didn't know that much about some of these issues. I actually spent two days on a farm, on a, a regenerative farm in, in Salisbury. Um, and this farmer was fantastic, A, for giving me his time of walking me around the place for two days, but also just the knowledge he had and the understanding. And he told me something really interesting, which I think we've got to learn from, which was um, organic dairy was invented 30 years ago. Um, it uses many of the same principles as regenerative. Um, in terms of pesticides and antibiotics in other areas, but they're slightly different. We shouldn't confuse the two. Um, it's better for the environment. It's got lower CO2, and it's better for your body. Um, and yet it's only 5% of UK demand after 30 years. And why is that? Um, and the market failure here is that the market looked at organic products and decided that they would be a premium. Um, and I had this conversation in New York as well, and it's exactly the same, it's 4% in the US, it's about 40% in Austria and Germany, it's very, very different. And he said to me, if there's one ask of the government and regulators, if you have a voice, is let's not make the same mistake with regenerative farming. Let's find a way of making this actually a better way to produce food that's incentivized by policy and that the supermarkets and others don't create a premium price and a label around it that then destroys the market for regenerative farming, just as it's, burned, as it's reborn um, to do it. I think that was a really interesting case example of where public policy and consumer demand, one of the GBF requirements, by the way, is not just for disclosures by large companies and financial institutions, but information to be made available, Clause 15, information to be made available to consumers. And I'm fascinated how this is going to work, because I look at consumer labels today, and they're overwhelming already. Um, but I wonder whether what WWF will help us put a you know, nature-positive stamp on a bar of soap. I'm not sure if that's the goal. But you know, I think this is an important part of this equation. How does government help consumer attitudes as well as others to, to address a market failure? Because we're going to go through the same failure with regenerative farming as we did with organic, if we're not careful. If I could just yeah, add one point go. to that. I think one way of thinking about this, the answer to this problem, and it, it, this works at the systemic level or within one sector, if we take ag, is you can think of a bunch of solutions lined up on an abatement cost curve, just like we did with climate to some extent. And there are some that are negative and have a negative cost and some that have a, have a, have a positive cost. And so government policy is clearly needed to help us create the markets, the subsidies, the incentives to address all of those levers that we have to tackle over the next 10 years that have a positive cost associated with them. But one of the things I found most interesting working closely with food companies and agricultural institutions in the last few months is how many of these farming levers do have a negative cost associated with it. In so far as that what we're asking farmers to do at the core is reduce input costs, it's reduce the consumption of fertiliser, reduce the consumption of pesticides, and that does have an impact on yields, but it also has an impact 
on cost. And so I think mm. what regenerative farming ends up looking like in some situations is higher profitability and lower yield. And so, which has its own systemic issues, but just to say that on that cost curve, there is a chunk of work that we can already start doing now, which is cultural. It's about companies setting clear targets and clear asks of farmers. Um, and then there's a bunch of work that does need the kind of policy intervention that you allude to. Thanks. Helen, do you know, if you're honest, the, the second question that we had around the kind of interplay between the sort of climate and sort of offset world and the biodiversity world. And I think this, I mean, this is a sort of an area that's quite live and fraught and something that I'm struggling, well, not struggling with, but engaged in quite a lot at the moment. And just wondered how, how you sort of see, you know, is there an opportunity as well as a trade-off? Like, how do you see that debate working through? So my, so my understanding from your question was that is the only opportunity offsets or is the, is the opportunity broader no, than that? Just like how are you just, yourselves <laughs> seeing the no. offset question? Right, okay, okay. Um, I think it's worrying because you don't get to net positive if we just focus on offsets. It is, however, a mechanism at the moment for funding restoration. That's, that's how I see it. Um, I mean, ultimately, the opportunities that we want are actually companies transitioning through their supply chains, moving into regenerative agriculture, or whatever the word is that we're going to use for agriculture, um, new improvements in water consumption, things like that. But I, I just don't know how we're going to get to nature restoration. Like, how do you get the, the billions moving for nature restoration? The only way I can see you doing that is in some sort of initial offset market. Now, biodiversity net gain is also a, is, is obviously a net gain of biodiversity credits. We're not going to do offsets. My understanding is that it will be net gain. I'm not a big fan of offsets, um, and I can see you nodding your head, so that's obviously what, what, how you feel. But I, if we can find another way of channeling private sector capital into na nature restoration in the next five years, I'll take it. But at the moment, that's how I see them working. They're absolutely imperative for the next five yeah. years. Otherwise, where's the money coming from? But um, I mean, that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, I, could, I suspect we could have a whole other panel <laughs> for much of the day and night on this as well. Nikita, on the, on the adaptation question, just interested around this sort of, you know, just as we often talk about mitigate, we talk about climate and nature, we often sort of separate out mitigation and adaptation, and useful to hear from you on, on how you see those connecting. Yeah, I mean, I actually think this is really where, like, nature comes into its own, because a lot of nature-based solutions are killing, this is a terrible pun, um, for, for nature are, are tackling multiple challenges at the same time. Um, so so your, your nature-based solutions are would ideally be making a landscape more resilient to climate change, i.e. adaptation, making those communities that benefit from that landscape therefore more resilient and mitigating at the same time while obviously improving the state of nature. Um, and so I actually think that it, there's a kind of neat link to the point around um, where's the commercial opportunity for nature if, and this you know, comes back to my kind of insurance example, that if, if we were able to price in um, the fact that in you know, five to ten years time um, an area would be significantly adversely affected by extreme weather events and climate change it really builds the case to invest in nature because often those nature-based solutions um, would would help us adapt um, so so i i i i oh and when it coming back to the kind of policy point um i think it's a real um danger that um both companies and government think about effectively what their climate strategy is, their mitigation strategy is, think about what their nature strategy is, because obviously the GBF requires, uh, requires countries to come up with national, um, national plans, uh, NBSAPs, and then separately you have an adaptation plan, and it kind of doesn't make any sense that the three of those are separate plans. Um, the good thing is, is that from the perspective of corporate transition plans, the transition plan task force is quite clear that the transition plan is meant to be a plan for a company to both align itself with um, kind of uh, the climate transition as well as adapt to a changing climate. Um, 
but there, but there is also an adaptation nature group in there as well because it obviously needs to be given uh, more weight. Um, but, but yeah, I, I definitely think that that um, this is this is really where nature comes into its own, and all nature-based solutions come into their own. So it feels like we need a Mother Earth plan that's kind of linking all of these things together. Um, there was a gentleman here and a gentleman at the back, and I'm going to just close down questions after that, and then just ask panel the panel to. Um, build in uh, their replies um, to their final remarks. Gentlemen here. Andrew Ross from Global Guidance. Question for you, David. Bond market investors have only one question. Who is asking for the money and what's their credit worthiness? Because the risk of default is the only thing that matters to them. And the question aligned with that is who has legal ownership and leverage in this arena. And my ask to you is, have you consulted with local authorities and cities who firstly are credit worthy and secondly have leverage through planning consent to deliver net zero and TNFD? Great, and let's hold that question. And there is the gentleman at the back. Hello, I'm uh, Bruce Howard, and in partnership with the Green Finance Institute, we're running the Nature Finance UK conference this uh, September. Uh, Nature-rich places are usually not devoid of people. There are social considerations here. And I just wondered whether the panel could comment on how we can avoid, in a sense, the social risk of a nature-positive economy particularly with those who look after land uh, a little bit worried uh, about relationships with corporates and financial services organisations they don't know. Thanks. Brilliant. So that's the idea of a just transition uh, in the nature space. David, could I invite you to answer the question specifically on TNFD and then I might just ask yeah. other panellists on the other points if that's okay. Um, the short answer is no, we haven't yet because we haven't started that work. As I said, we're going to do bond work later, so I wouldn't pretend that we've actually done that. You're right that the credit worthiness is dependent on your ability to pay off the debt, and your ability to pay off the debt is based on ecosystem services that you rely upon. So if you are dependent on water and you've borrowed against that dependency but you didn't factor in, you've got a credit issue. So this is why Moody said we've got a large billion dollar number, I can't remember what exactly it was, of, of risk um, because of these issues. So this is why the rating agencies are starting to look at it and why we will do it next, not now. Um, the society question is a brilliant one. Um, the average farm, I think, is below four hectares or something in the world. Uh, you cannot do nature without looking at local communities. I'll just answer your question with one real example of a trade-off. Um, have a look at what's happening in Holland. Um, reducing the amount of nitrate fertiliser that can be used because they've polluted the soil. It's like putting the heroin in the soil that keeps it going and going. So controls come in to restrict um, mass protest because of course that transition from reliance on fertilizer to a more organic approach takes five to ten years. And a good example, a, a real example of where you have to think about this transition with the communities who are stewards and dependent on, on nature. And this is why this is difficult. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, Nikita, do you want to talk just a couple of words on the Just Transition point? Yeah, I mean, the, the Just Transition concept is starting to be fleshed out for climate. It's obviously been um, kind of a, a, a live concept when talking about the climate transition. It's no different for a nature positive transition. I think the, the interesting thing about nature is that it's very location specific in some ways. And actually, there is a, a possibly more of an opportunity to engage local communities in um, restoring nature than there is, obviously, for climate. I mean, the voice of indigenous people has been sort of very prominent in the negotiations at GBF. Um, and they're kind of mentioned explicitly, I believe, in the framework. And so I think, in fact, local communities are often more likely to be the stewards, the best stewards um, of a local landscape often. So, so there's, I think uh, there's a real opportunity there. Thank you, Sebastian. Final reflections from you. I mean, the only thing I'd add on, on the social um, point is that a lot of uh, the most important 
kind of nature management practices, a lot of the folks who are actually um, uh, protecting, managing nature and, and in enabling those ecosystem services are doing so for free because a lot of those ecosystem services are unpriced. And so I think as we move towards a world of you know, this perfect policy nirvana, if eventually you get there, where all of these nature markets are properly functioning and these ecosystem services are priced and people are properly compensated, then there should be a mass transfer of wealth eventually from the industrial level north to the globalized south and to from other sectors towards agriculture and towards essentially marginalized groups who have been doing this work for free who, who shouldn't be doing it going forward. So I think nature as an agenda actually provides quite an inspiring framework through which to justify the transition of some of this wealth over the long term. Mm -hmm. And Helen? Yeah, just speaking about the UK really, and I agree with all the, the comments made on global, um, I think like this is the moment for social, like I'm really excited because to what's been mentioned before, this is the moment we can like sort of shoehorn in some of those equality issues that we've just kind of left to the side for a long time through nature. Um, we're working a lot with some projects in Scotland to really learn from them on some of their, um, and I know you know them, Bruce, too, because we work on them, to, with them with you with them. Um, there are some amazing projects that are making money, that are very ethical around their offsets and their actually net gain, that are giving back 13% to the com community and are selling carbon for £65 a tonne. Like, it can actually be done if you just participate with community rather than just tick a box on community engagement. And we're really keen to see UK government start to put some principles around this. They have mentioned it in the Nature Markets framework, um, because we are going to be start starting to be asked the question, who's making the money and what's the social impact of these nature um, projects? I'm just talking markets, I'm not talking sort of the broader transition with farmers. So I'm, I'm all for it. I think this is, this is the moment for social. <laughs> Well, that, that's a great point to kind of pull the thread of the conversation together. Huge thanks to the panel. Um, it's been, I've learnt loads um, as ever from all of you. Um, I guess sort of my takeaways are very much around how we try to kind of move from seeing, seeing climate and nature in these different silos. What does that mean really practically all the way down from kind of how these different treaties are sat side by side, but also uh, in terms of data requirements about making sure that we're kind of seeing uh, this transition in a social context, uh, not just um, uh, in a sort of data and, and climate and nature context. Um, and also just really paying as much attention to the opportunity as the risk. So um, lots of really big themes and huge thanks to all the panel.